Right. First of all, uh, let me confess. I have a gastronomical and a pathological fear of speaking after lunch. <laughs> and that pathological and gastronomical fear rises to the degree, to the nth degree, especially when participants, hosts, organizers group in and they say, Khana <laughs> Because then I tend to believe that the organizers have a sort of a collective conspiracy to put the speaker, the postman speaker, in a fix. <laughs> and then uh, I hear Somali man saying, What garmi hai, AC ko chalu kar dete hai. And I say, Yeah. And then they say, No. <laughs> Friends, uh, you know, it's like a Pardon the pun of the word, but it's like a virtual homecoming. I say virtual homecoming because so many of the faces uh, that I see, dear, dear friends here, have been faces as icons on the computer interface, whether it was on Zoom, whether it was on WebEx. And over the last two and a half to three years, um, I say, I'm reminded the uh, you know, I go back to the last Jurassic age. I have been teaching in Islip College <laughs> for, for donkey's years now. And I still remember back in the last millennium, we used to have something called pen pads. Pen pads. Yeah. So I did part of my schooling. My father was in Indian Air Force and I did part of my schooling in Delhi. So we used to go, as a child, we used to go to these embassies in order to list up possible friends across the borders, international friends, and we used to call them pen pals. I relate to you this anecdote only because I see before me so many of us, not as pen pals, but as virtual pals or call them digi pals. <laughs> In a conference such as this, I say it's a virtual homecoming for me because a letter that was posted by Somali Nan in the last millennium finally reached me. <laughs> we talked about postcards. Postcards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Mishra sir was referring to the postmen and the postcards and the post offices. And I still remember a good 20 years, two decades back. Um, so one man was to invite me and she dropped a postcard. I didn't all right, whatever. It never reached me. <laughs> and in India. Okay, all, all right, all right. And in India. But the, but the carrier or the courier of that Indian letter was our friendly neighborhood postman. Yes. So somehow or the other, in this story, in this tale of the purloined letter, right, uh, that invite never reached me. And so, during the pandemic, when we first met, or rather we first connected virtually, the first thing Somali man told me is, you know, you have disgraced my first invite. <laughs> so, friends, um, I'm going to do uh, things a little counterintuitive. In a, in a conference whose title is about literature, culture, media and technology, I'm going to be media-less and digital-less so that there are, there are no PowerPoints, there is no presentation. There is of course an Alpedia motive for that <laughs> because like many of our students, we have perfected, we have mastered the art of keeping our eyes open and pretending to <laughs> look at the PPT <laughs> while we are sort of, you know, I mean zombies. Um, thank you so much, mm. the organizers, thank you so much, uh, the organizers of this national conference uh, to have me here. It's been an absolute delight. In fact, uh, today and tomorrow, I also have the, I have the opportunity, I've already made a great friend in Vishwasa. And uh, so to cut to the chase, I'm going to speak on um, what is a book in the time of the shelf? Uh, 
there was a bit of a confusion when I first, so Madhivan said, uh, please WhatsApp me the title of your talk. So I sent her this title, What is a Book in the Time of the Shelf? And then the next evening she gave me a call saying, uh, don't mind my asking, but isn't there a spell end on here? <laughs> <laughs> I am the storyteller here, let me finish. Yeah. No, no, you don't steal my discourse from me. You invited me. <laughs> you see, this is what happens when the food is good and the host forgets that she's playing is supposed to keep quiet. <laughs> no, no, you can defend after after I do mine. Yeah. So coming back, back to the chase, a lot of people, she said that it generated quite a debate in the department itself with people saying, no, 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 it, it is uh, selfie and uh, so there were certain aspersions that were cast on my credentials itself. <laughs> who, who is this fellow that you are calling who doesn't know how to spell self, selfie? So I thought I want to do something where I'm talking about books in the time of shelf. Um, in a conference, and we were just talking, um, Dinesh sir and I, we are partners in crime, as he likes to say. And my wife keeps telling me that you've got something of a romance going on with it. <laughs> we call it romance. Uh, yeah, romance going on. So we were just talking about disruptions, that interesting word, disruptions. Why it is, you know, we know interventions, we know insertions. We know intersections also, but disruptions and uh, the connotation of the word has undergone uh, quite a bit of a change and both the denotative as well as the connotative meaning. So when you talk about in media studies and techno studies these days, when you're talking about a disruptive, a disruptive or a disruption, then we are talking about something that is uh, uh, a black swan moment. A black swan moment is a turning is a turning point. It it is it sort of signals both an epistemic and as well as a cultural shift in the narrative of what you have. So I'm going to talk about how in a conference which focuses both on the intersectionality as well as the disruptive shifts brought about in literature and culture by uh, digital technologies and social media tools. I thought I'd invite you to engage with me um, on something very basic and fundamental, and that is the idea of a book itself. Uh, in order to examine what I'd like to do in the next an hour and a half, I said 90 minutes, <laughs> in the next hour and a half is I'd like to talk about examining what a book was, what a book is, and what a book is becoming. So what I propose to do is to look at the, the radical ways in which digital, digital technologies and social media tools are changing the very thing that we hold in our hand. Uh, whether it is a book-bound literature, something that has a cover, something that has pages, something that has a spine and a jacket, as well as to those of my young friends here, uh, who perhaps are more accustomed to holding an interactive digital screen reader. Big word, isn't it? What I mean is your smartphone. <laughs> so I'm, I, I, I chose this topic deliberately because I'm interested. Uh, uh, I do a lot of culture studies and uh, I'm particularly interested in examining uh, how are reading technologies with new media tools how are they producing a sort of a new aesthetics, what I'd like to call a new aesthetics of bookishness. And as a corollary, I'm tempted to look in my talk to look at how writers are evolving. So let me begin by asking, especially my young friends at the back, when was the last time uh, you visited a bookshop? A bookstore. Just random. I mean, it's not a KBC quiz. <laughs> when was the last time you visited a bookshop? Three years back. 
Oh, great, 15 days back. And which, did you actually buy a book? Yes, sir. Which one was that? Uh, it was uh, just academic book uh, for class 12. Oh, I thought you would say uh, Theory in Praxis by Kanti Panerjee. <laughs> 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 Never mind, all right. Okay. So, um, when was the last time, um, when was the last time you took a book to bed? When was the last time you took a book to bed? <laughs> of course you would. When was the last time you dog-eared, you dog-eared the pages of the book? Uh, when was the last time you lost a book? Or when was the last time you pinched somebody else's book? Uh, when was the last time you underlined, highlighted, or scribbled on the margins of a book? You know, when I was, uh, allowed me, allowed me to indulge in a nostalgia. Uh, when I was growing up with books, I, I would often identify, I could often identify a book by its smell. Yeah, I have, being a Bengali, I have a pronounced olfactory sense. <laughs> but I say this because I could tell if a new book was published by Vintage or Viking, or Penguin or Random House simply by bringing my nose to the book. Uh, because, because back then, or even now for that matter, um, the, the print copies of each publishing house had a distinctive smell, had a distinctive aroma, shall I say, for lack of a better word, a distinctive smell, a unique, a unique aroma of its own. And, you know, as an avid book lover, uh, the most exciting event of my college years uh, were to visit College Street, College Street in Kolkata, and spend hours, spend hours uh, uh, browsing and buying books. Of course, you know, back then the excitement, the excitement of visiting College Street, College Street is a street which is, you know, whose pavements are full, filled with second-hand booksellers. Okay. So the excitement of going to College Street was in making sort of a serendipitous find. You know, like uh, I remember picking up a rare find, a rare edition of Palgrave's Golden Treasury of Songs. Um, I remember picking up, um, finding a much thumbed copy of Rambo's A Season in Hell. And uh, also, uh, you know, Norman Mailer's, Norman Mailer's Armies of the Nine, you know, absolutely. I had throw away prices, cheap, dirt cheap prices. So the pleasure of buying a book, the pleasure of buying a book back then was as much in getting the book that you were looking for, but also quickly stealing, or quickly not stealing, quickly reading through ten more. <laughs> So, free steals or free reads. Um, today, Amazon, Goodread, Kindle sort of keep notifying me uh, with books based on a very complex algorithm of, um, you know, they're a complex algorithm which they derive from your order history or what is called your purchase history. And so, a book then at one point in time, if you look at the history of book, the materiality of book, then at one time a book was a codex. Or even going further back in history, the history of the materiality of book, at one time a book was a tablet in cuneiform script. Then it became a codex. Then it became a typeface, a movable typeface. Um, so buying books back then was exciting because it was unpredictable. Yeah. You never knew in book, in which bookshop, in which pay, with who, with which pavement seller, you would discover a Golconda. So today, when you compare your book buying, just the simple act, the simple cultural practice of buying a book, it is today now prompted by, by a program coded in a software. And so, what I miss personally, what I miss in the process is the thrill of a chance discovery or uh, the joy of a memorable find in a bind. Uh, I thought I'm going to bring this topic also because 
those of you who have been, uh, who follow news about books, not just books that make news, but news about books. In the last couple of years, while we were hit with the pandemic, there's been a lot of talk about the death of the book. By, uh, by the death of the book, meaning, of course, the death of the author, or rather the death of God, in a Nietzschean sense, then the death of the author, in the Barthian sense, and then there's been a lot of gap fest on the death of the book. Last year, I remember, the New York Times ran um, a series called The Future of Reading, right, with a question mark. That, that made it very suggestive. So, it had an essay called, a series of essays, uh, written by some of the most prominent contemporary writers, including uh, uh, Alice Walker, uh, and uh, Ian McEwen and Amit Chaudhary. Uh, so, and the Hindu, the Hindu, the Sunday Hindu published uh, an article titled The Death of the Book Again. Now that's another interesting title, The Death of the Book Again. So it seemed to suggest as if the book had already died and there was a sort of a resurrection, there was a sort of a revival of the book. And then that caught my um, cultural eye and I, in 2020, Jeff Gomez, Jeff Gomez, who's a book historian, he's a book historian and a book artist, he sort of cashed in on this buzz, this talk that was going out about the future of the book, the mortality of the book, and he wrote a book called Print is Dead, Print is Dead, Books in our Digital Age. Print is Dead, Books in our Digital Age. And there, there have been a lot many books that have come out in, in the last couple of years. All of them seem to suggest, all of them sort of either eulogizing the books, the death of the books, or singing pains about the team book, that is, the physical book. So it leads me to a question to ask you that are books dying? Are books really dying in the age of social media? Are books really dying in the age of social media? Because it's something that concerns us. It's something that is at the focus, at the core of what you and I do in our learning spaces. Our entire academic ecosystem is based on books. And uh, what what are we to make of books in a digital age? What are we to what are we to make of books that are sort of that that do not have even text as we understand that are there that appear as pixels, as digits and pixels on an interface interactive screen? What are we then to relate? How are we to relate these digital books, this onslaught? or the swamping of reading culture with digital books, what do we make when we come to, when we teach Bacon, for instance, or when we teach a Milton in the class, and then think about, oh, uh, you know, what Milton immortalized, our familiar notion of the physical book by saying that a book is the precious lifeblood and the master spirit of, um, uh, what is it, embalmed, embalmed and treasured up. Isn't it embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a light beyond life? What are we What are we to make of uh, Francis Bacon when he made the very act of reading a palatable exercise? Then we have food again. That a good book, no, not a good book. Some books are to be tasted, <laughs> others to be swallowed, and a few to be chewed and digested. Isn't it? Friends, my purpose here is to examine primarily. What a book as a cultural artifact is or was. How are we reading books? How are writers responding to the so-called technological threat to book-bound literature? So overall, you could say that my, uh, my thoughts that I, as I present before you are driven by a shared anxiety among a lot of people, including perhaps you, book lovers, many book lovers, I call it um, epistemic angst, or to put it very simply, a bookish despair. <laughs> and 
you know, the bookish despair, meaning the fear that uh, the print novel will vanish into a sort of uh, dark, fathomless, or seamless depths of a digital culture. And with it will end our literary, our tradition of a literary culture or a cultural literature. So what I propose to do is to map the radical ways in which the history, the materiality, and the cultural production of books are changing or have changed now. And I feel this re-examination is important because of three reasons, or rather two reasons. One is, I think it's important for us to look at the cultural production, the cultural notion of book, reading, authorship, scholarship, because to look at, for example, the ways in which the form and function of the book, what do we make of a book, what do we, what have we been making of a book? Uh, the book as a transmitter of epistemy, uh, uh, the book as a narration of stories, the book as a, repos as a repository of knowledge, the book has um, a source of information and entertainment. You know, these are the various so-called protocols by which a book has been of service since the beginning of culture. So, what I'd like to do therefore is to look at the various ways, the radical ways, the disruptive ways in which digital technology and social media tools are changing this very notion of what a book is in a post-print age. You know, what Catherine Haynes, uh, again a cultural critic, calls a post-print age. So in short, what I'm interested is, is not simply giving you a teleological account of the book. By that I mean, I'm not here going to present to you a book's material or textual history. But what I am going to do is to quickly give you an overview of how in its long sort of long history of transformation. Like I said, from the Egyptian tablet in cuneiform script to a touch screen interface. And so, how has the idea of the book changed both uh, in our cultural imagination, in our cultural and literary landscape? The second thing that I'd like to do before you is to examine how the book's mutation, the book's mutation, the book's transformation from a P-book, that is a physical book, to an electronic book, from a P-book to an E-book, how, how does it change the idea of the author? Remember Michel Foucault's iconic seminal essay called What is an Author, not Who is an Author? So I would look at the many ways in which the digital book is changing the very notion of not what is an, not who is an author, but what is an author. How do we therefore reinvent or reinscribe the Foucauldian notion of the author as a function? in the times of digital print. The third thing um, is to find out if writers themselves, I mean contemporary, especially fiction writers, if writers themselves are, how are they responding to the so-called RIP of books? Uh, what, are the, what are the new literary strategies, call it experimentation, innovation, uh, both rhetorical as well as narrative devices. What are they doing in order to write, write to this singular, techno-driven, culturally disruptive moment of our age? This moment, which sort of hooks, this point hooks to the concept note of the theme. So, all right. I just outlined to you what I'm going to say. So now here I say. <laughs> what is a bookshelf? I'm going to read out an interesting quote by Italo Calvino. Calvino wrote a, an essay, a collection of essays called The Literary Machine, which came out in 1997. The book, interestingly, is called The Literary Machine. You know, it sort of anticipates. Look how prescient, how prescient Italo Calvino Italo Calvino, the very famous postmodern fabulous that we know him to be. Uh, so he wrote a collection of uh, essays, uh, compiled a collection of essays in a book that is titled The Literary Machine, which came out in 1997. And this is what he had to say, and I quote <clears throat> The title of the essay is What is a Bookshelf? 
Imagine, what a, what a wonderful, you, know, you could say trivia, but curio about the book itself. So I draw your attention to this quote. A book is written, he says, a book is written so that it can be put beside other books. <laughs> a book is written so that it can be put beside other books and take its place on a hypothetical bookshelf. And I'm not carrying any digital gadget on me. Right. I draw your attention back to that line. I find it very interesting. He says, a book is written so that it can be put beside other books and take its place in a hypothetical bookshop. Once it is there, in some way or other, it alters the shelf. Expelling. Expelling certain other volumes from their places or forcing them back into the second row. <laughs> why demanding, why demanding that certain others should be brought up in front? This is a quote from a very interesting essay, as I said, on the literary machine. The essay is what is a bookshelf. Now, I mean, this kind of you know, Calvino's uh, comment deserves a little more careful reflection, a little more careful engagement. Uh, first, think about again, basic things. How, where and how do we keep books in our house? Where and how do we keep our books in the house? Why do we keep, often, why do we keep our books in the most visible and prominent spaces? Spaces. Uh, drawing room, study room, the hallway. Spaces that invite public scrutiny, or shall we say, borrowing or reinventing mildly space, a gaze. And not, not of course a male gaze, but a gaze. It makes us think that reading, which is supposed to be a private, intimate, personal history of reading, a practice, a cultural practice which is intimate, which is, which is personal and private, how we put it out all there, in a bookshelf to be seen by whosoever is a visitor. I think if you look carefully, uh, we do so because you know books on our bookshelves are both are both a metaphoric and a metonymic indicator of our literary taste and our cultural tradition, our cultural sensibility. I mean, so our bookshelves you know, do not just showcase. They do not just showcase books, but um, what we read, which authors we like, what genres we prefer. Sometimes our bookshelves do something more, and this is of a higher cultural significance. Bookshelves also showcase not only our personal reading habits, but also signify the literary tradition of a family or the cultural aura of a city. The next quote that I'm going to read out to you is from an award-winning essay. It won the Pushkar Prize for the best essay by Amitabh Ghosh. A wonderful essay which is titled, the, the, oh, yeah, okay, yes, yes. The Testimony of My Grandfather's House. That is the title of his Pushkar Prize winning essay called The Testimony of My Grandfather's Bookcase. And he writes here, and I'm quoting, he says, The walls of my grandfather's house were lined with rows of books, including Fraser's The Golden Bound, the collected works of Sigmund Freud, Marx and Engels' Manifesto has to be bombed. Neatly stacked, neatly stacked in glass fronted bookcases. So they let the visitor know that this was a house in which books were valued. Or that we, that is their family, that we were a cultivated people. <laughs> and then goes on to add, rather tongue in cheek, he says, This is always important in Dhaka. For Calcutta is a bookish city. 
Is Durga a bookish city? <laughs> is Murki a bookish city? Is Nagpur a bookish city? Interesting, no? If you ask yourself, right? So there you are. I mean, a bookshelf, therefore, is not simply um, an assemblage or a collectible of print arranged in, a, in an orderly fashion. Books on your our bookshelf, you know, they signify our taste, they signify our culture, they signify our identity, and as Ho says, sometimes the intellectual aura of a city itself. Friends, if books therefore are cultural artifacts, cultural artifacts that symbolize the personal taste, your personal taste and your family's history, then think about it, aren't bookshelves therefore things that museumize, museumize and I'm getting tongue twisted now. Things that museumize and uh, memorialize. Ah, there, yeah, finally it's out. Things that museumize and memorialize a particular tradition of reading. Think about it. Right. Alright. Give that thought a pause. Let me ask you another question. What is the most prominent, visible, cultural marker of your obsession with yourself in the age of social media? What is the most visible marker? The most visible marker of your obsession with your own self in the age of social media? The selfie. <laughs> So as we were in the morning, we were doing the rounds of the college, right, and we visited the Department of English. So my man was very insistent that we visit the selfie corner. <laughs> 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 huh? Yeah. So there was a selfie corner, isn't it? And it's now become an institutional best practice. We have a selfie corner. Okay. Do we have a selfie corner? <laughs> I think about it. <laughs> Okay. So, well, what is the selfie? I mean, you know, you could say that a selfie, as a media theorists would say, that a selfie is a virtual way of putting it out there, putting yourself out there, publicizing, circulating, and it's a kind of affirming yourself, isn't it? As somebody, oh, Bill Stock, this is another writer that I came upon, I read very recently. And he's written a book, very interesting again, he's written a book called Selfie, Selfie, how the West became self obsessed. <laughs> well, it's not just the West. We all, the title of the book by Bill, uh, by Bill Stowe is Selfie, how the West became self obsessed. Now, he calls the selfie as a mode of empowering exhibitionism. He calls it a mode of empowering exhibition. Sorry, exhibitionism. So I ask you, who is a shelfie? So, <laughs> a lot of my young friends are here, they're smiling and smiling, as in a PSA, or as in a missing musical point. Wait a minute, who is a shelfie? A shelfie is a picture of you with your books. Right. I mean, posted of course online, on Insta, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Zoom platforms. Right? So when we shifted our entire uh, teaching learning system, you know, from offline to online, in the beginning, while we were still trying to learn the tricks of digital culture, and we learned so fast, people don't acknowledge actually how quickly from digital migrants, at least people like me who are digital migrants, how quickly we sort of, uh, you know, how quickly we learned and. Uh, with all the default settings, with all the I iconic icons, and <laughs> with uh, with the template speech of the day, are you there? <laughs> am I audible? Huh? Am, I, am I audible? Am I audible? Are you there? <laughs> so, um, so we have seen how the tendency of presenters. I am an equally guilty of that. As presenters, as speakers of virtual platforms, you know, how we like to use the default setting of Zoom with a nice book-lined bookshelf where 
In the beginning, I used to hear this squint and see, can I read the titles of the books? But I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. Because, and then after a point, the default setting also turned the bookshelf into a blur, so that the focus could be you. Right. Deep focus. All right. So clearly, I mean, the habit of putting up a shelfie, shelf now, your image with books and bookshelves in the background, clearly was meant to be a statement that you belong to high culture and, and, and literary <laughs> sophistication. Right. So, so this, if the selfie, therefore, friends, if the selfie is a sort of a fetishization of the self, if the selfie is a sort of a narcissistic uh, uh, barter, I'm using theory words, he loves it, right? A narcissistic barter into uh, the, the economies of social media attention. Or if the selfie is a digital insertion by the logic of late capitalism, ah, Frederick Jameson again, right? So then, people's obsession, friends, people's obsession to showcase themselves with their bookshelves needed a cultural construct. It needed a label, a tag. This shelf. Am I visible? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the shelf, I'm, I'm looking at the transition, the migration that we did from selfie to shelf. And I think it is, I mean, despite, you know, despite uh, the lighter side of it, I think it's a crucial cultural turning point. All right. Because what we are trying to do that if the shelfie is a visual spectacle of ourselves on social media, on the, on the, on the internet, then a shelfie is one way which makes a virtual spectacle of books. And what is consistent therefore, despite, despite this technological divide between what we traditionally consider a book to be and what a b-book is and what an e-book is, the value that we, I'm not using the word value in a Marxist sense, not the use of the extreme value, but value, simple value. The value that we attach to both formats of the book is the same. And that is our deep attachment to books, our deep learning or passion for books, isn't it? So if the bookshelf or the bookshelf has given birth to a new species or a new homo, a new kind of homo sapiens, that is the shelfie, then what do we make of book covers in the digital age? Here again, I draw your attention to another award-winning essay written by Jhumpa Nai. Uh, this, is a, this was a book that I came upon while we were in lockdown and I consider it to be as brilliant in its incisiveness as Italo Calvino's The Literary the Literature Machine some written 20, 25 years back. Now she has brought up a book whose title is so close to us, The Clothing of Books. It's about book jackets, it's about book covers. I find it, I find that when writers write about uh, what Madam said about paratexts, paratexts, you know, these are precisely the paratexts. The clothing of the book, the book jacket, the index page, the cover page, the table of contents, the foreword, all of it highly considers a book cover to be an intrinsic part of the book itself, of the narrative in the book itself. It's not just a decorative piece, it's not just an ornamental thing to cover your book. It's basically a good book cover, right? A good book cover is something that adds value, that adds meaning, that adds, it is a symbolic trope to the content, to the narrative of the book itself. So, she says, she argues in that essay that the cover of a book also has a metaphoric function. Why? Because look how quickly, without any digital interface, it actually is doing what digital technology does. It turns a print medium into a visual art. It turns text or rather it invites our engagement with the narrative, which is our text, into an aesthetic experience. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I take this opportunity of being, uh, taking Wordsworth's egotistical supply. <laughs> uh, this is, friends, a recent publication of mine. And I, 
I brought this book also to show you the kind of uh, uh, insights that Lagerie was making about the clothing of cloth. And this is cloth cover. This is cloth cover because it is hand designed, hand pasted uh, by by uh, uh, by a weaver from Dhaka. This is handloom sari. This is handloom sari. This is handloom sari. Oh, nice. yeah. Okay, the cloth is handloom hand sari. And I would like to take this opportunity to mention the name of the weaver. Uh, the, art, the artist, forget the weaver, the artist. His, his name is Tulamiya Moyurti. He's from Dhaka. And this book was published by one of the oldest publishing houses writer's workshop. So, despite the cliché, I mean a book is often judged by its cover. <laughs> yeah, are we good? So, Nayari in this essay, The Clothing of the Book, she sort of laments how her book covers are seldom, how her book covers are seldom chosen by her. <laughs> and, uh, chosen by her publisher. Uh, sometimes leading to a sometimes leading to a cross mismatch between the stories that she wants to tell and the story that the book cover says. Because she says that for some publishing houses, the minute they know it is Chupa Lahiri, so her name and her photograph of course is there, right? But they are also quickly, these publishing houses, including random house publishing houses, I mean to quickly commission, to quickly commission a book cover, that sort of things with images that uh, typify India, you know, mm -hmm. elephants, yeah. uh, snakes, exotic flowers, Hina painted. Yeah. So um, she says, uh, how absurd it seems, how absurd it is for the writer to realize that a book like Namesake has nothing to do with the Ganga or the Himalayas. And yet they put the Kamala <laughs> name on the cover page. Right. And then she says, and I quote, she, she writes in this essay, I am forced at times to accept book jackets. I am forced. It's almost at, at gunpoint. I am forced at times to accept book jackets that I dislike, that I find problematic and disappointing. And then she asks this question in the essay, saying, My book tells, my books tell stories. But what stories, meanwhile, do my covers tell? Such, an, such a intriguing thought, isn't it? So my books tell stories, but what stories do my covers tell? So for Lahiri, therefore, for, for writers like Lahiri, you know, the book jacket is not just the text first story. It's not. It's in fact the first impression, even as it, even as it sort of trans, translates, transcribes, and trans creates what is text, what is print into a visual medium, and which is precisely what digital technology does. So, uh, talk about digital technology and what is what it is doing to our familiar notion of what a book was or what a book is. All this is changing. So, big, there's a book historian named uh, Gerard Janet. Um, he's Coined, incidentally, man, he coined the word paratex, uh, Jen, right? And he, um, of course, talks about these devices. Paratex are these devices to frame a book, so content, index, you know, forward, all of it. Um, I can't resist mentioning here an example, an extreme example of book publishing. We all want that piece of literary immortality, don't we? To write a book is to <laughs> leave your imprint on immortality or eternity, isn't it? So uh, when we talk about, so there is an extreme example of um, give me a minute. Huh. 
there's an there's a there's an extreme example of book publishing. What if no if if nobody wants to print your book? <laughs> yeah. What if nobody wants to print your book? You've written a book. You have sent your manuscript to different. We were talking about booksellers, right? Book publishers, rather. Uh, last evening. And you can do two things. One, you can self-publish on Amazon. But here is an example. The example that I'm going giving you is an extremity again about the very cultural, the way in which books are going to be published in future. This is an extreme example. What is it? And here it is. An artist named Fiona Banner. An artist named Fiona Banner. In 2009, she published herself. Now, I use that word herself within quote. She published herself. How? After repeated rejections, rejections of the store of the of the of a manuscript, when right? some 40, 50 rejections came, nobody was prepared to. to published her, what she did was she tattooed an ISBN number on her backside. <laughs> no, I'm seen it. Yeah, yeah. Much like and turned it into an exhibit. Much like Marcel Duchamp did, you know what? With a cover. <laughs> she and therefore I said she published herself by tattooing what we call the International Standard Book Number, ISVN, on a lower back. Right. So our very idea of publishing in an age of digital technology is, you know, constantly changing and being radicalized in so many different ways. So, what is a book becoming then? What I call bookishness at its limits. Right. Because I'm asking this question to you because again it appears to me that the book, both as a material object as well as a discursive cultural phenomenon, is changing in unprecedented ways. Because until recently, un until recently, I still remember the OED. You open the page of Oxford uh, Dictionary, uh, maybe something that you purchased in till 2000, okay, and it will tell you. Look at the dictionary meaning. Look at the meaning of the book, the definition of a book that the OED gives. And I'm going to read out that. It says, the OED defines or describes a book as a written or printed work consisting of pages glued or sewn together along one side and bound in colors. Today, a book may have no spine. Ah! <laughs> Yeah. A book may have no pages. A book may not even have words because you have audio books. Right. So today we are literally seeing um, a new, the very notion of book as a cultural construct undergoing an absolute transformation driven by, driven by a, a digitally controlled market economy. Capitalism is at the center of it. So it is a digitally controlled market economy that we are seeing. So the entire production of what we now call it by its generic term, electronic literature or e-literature is the result of it. Um, technology is also technologies also are sort of, you know, uh, look at the interfaces, look at the interfaces of Kindle and Nook, for instance. What are they doing to the practice of reading, to the uh, to the cultural construct of an author or scholarship? Because what Kindle and Nook do is to pour. These are liquid texts, mind you. I mean, media theorists call it liquid. As if the text has become fluid, molten, liquid. So what you see when you read, when you open your Kindle, or when you go on Nook and you are reading it, you are basically talk. You, what you are basically reading are words that have been poured into vessels, into electronic vessels. Now that itself is pretty, pretty fascinating, isn't it? And so um, writers, recent writers who work directly with tablets or let's say with an iPhone or an iPad uh, for an Apple or an Android operating system, what they do is 
they not only tell us how to read, or rather not only give us something to read, but also tell us how to read. I call it haptic technology, a haptic mode of reading. Touch screen, or we call it touch. So a book, a book, today's e-book, sort of reinvents the tactile, the tactile experience of holding a book, smelling a book, with an interface which is sensitive to your touch. And there's a book that I would like to mention. Yeah. This is a book, this is a novel called Strange Rain. It's called Strange Rain. This book came out in 2011 by a writer named Eric Loya. What he does in this book is to use the touch screen, the touch screen, the interactive screen itself, to give to the reader an immersive experience. An immersive experience. So it, he takes advantage of the app that is available on iPad, on iPhone, to sort of integrate or incorporate the, the glass screen of an iPhone or an iPad itself. What I mean by this is, it allows the reader, this book called Strange Rain, allows the reader, <laughs> you can go to your favorite couch, put up your feet, take the Kindle or the Nook or the iPhone, hold it above your head, and feel in the narrative when there is a rain scene, when the skies go cloud, there is a video that is embedded in the text itself which gives you a 3D cinematic experience of rain falling on the screen, creating ripples. <laughs> and not just that, when you tap on the screen, what also comes out appears against the cloud, against the skylight, if you say. What also comes out on the skylight are the dispersive moods of, this, of the protagonist, of this protagonist, which means that the interface is not just a tech gimmick. It's not that high-fangled gadgetry that you say, oh, it gives me a 3D version, so what? Right? You go to, if you've seen the Avatar 2, you put on a 3D version and it, it, it gives you that immersive sense. But can you imagine a book in today's age Right, giving you that, allows you that haptic and that tactile experience that if it is describing a character sitting and brooding on a rain-filled or a cloud-filled day and the rain pours, when you have ripples on your screen. So what it does then, or is, is that a, is that a sign? No, 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 that's not a sign. No, because even if you give me a sign, I'll keep on going. <laughs> So, so what is friends? What is a book? Again, I press. I pop up the same question. What is a book in our postmodern, post post author age? <laughs> So in the Kindle era, the Nook era, the answer seems pretty clear. Uh, in contrast to a P-book, an e-book might seem to be an, what my words, an unesthetized file, a file. In the language of computers, it seems like an unesthetized file. Have you opened, is it possible for you to open on Kindle a book such as this or Drupal Diary? and have the sensory experience of looking at the clothing of the book, the book cover. No. So, um, an e-book, an e-book then seems to be like an unesthetized file, a sort of a disembodied directory in HTML or JavaScript. For the simple reason that an e-book doesn't have a physical form, it doesn't have a shape, and Kindle therefore turns, gives you a liquid a liquid text. So digitalizing a book also sort of removes the book from the shelf. It removes the book from the cover, it removes the book from its spine, and it removes the book from the shelf. And the book becomes its text. Or shall we say the text becomes the book? 
such a phenomenon where the text becomes the book. Why? Because you can put it on your computer screen, you can open a directory or a file, you can insert the book, or at least part of the contents of the book in an email, you can post it on a discussion board, and you can do so many things that we already are doing on WhatsApp groups with our students, isn't it? So, what does it make there for a book? What is a book becoming in our postmodern, postprint age? I think again that um, books, books are precious to us because there is an ownership about it. It's not just about an authorship of the writer, there is an ownership about it. There is a sense of pride and possession. <laughs> I reminded of Mark Twain. <laughs> Never in the book. But you know that very famous anecdote. Why you are having the cup? It's time to uh, for this anecdote. You know, Mark Twain. Uh, he had a, he wanted to mow his lawn, so he went over to his neighbors and he said, uh, "Boss, can I have your lawn mower?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, you're most welcome. Use the lawn mower on my lawn." <laughs> now it's all happened after a week. This friend of his, this neighbor of his, wanted a book. So he came to Mark Twain and he said, you know what, can you give me a book? He said, yeah, you're most welcome. You read it in my library. <laughs> uh, never a lender, nor a borrower be. In a different context, no? Uh, how are we doing? Snooze time? No? Okay. Keeping you with me? All right, good. It's like, the virtual, the virtual voice also becomes in a physical mode. I keep telling, after classes resumed and all my students came back to the class, I keep, I still keep saying, are you there with me? <laughs> and one of my students said, all the way, sir. <laughs> I said, you, are, you say this as if I am paving the path to hell. <laughs> So, to come back to the, the book as a material object, the book as a physical, as a physical history. Um, sir talked about archive. I'll take two more minutes for that point. <laughs> when, how many universities? You know, I'm reminded that, eh? look, these are interventions, no? I mean, you say, uh, is it? I, intersections. Intersections, yeah. So these are intersections. So I'm reminded, I, I'm reminded of uh, Harvard University project, sir. It's called the Online Book Archive Project. Okay, much like the Gothenburg project. So um, they are on to a project where they are trying to retrieve, restore, and uh, and, and record. Uh, they are starting, you know, literally era-wise, and right now they are doing a 19th century, which is Victorian literature. Now, I came upon, on, on, on Google, I came upon a very interesting uh, article on their project, which said that, you know, that while they were retrieving, uh, retrieving and restoring these books, 19th century Victorian literature, they came upon a startling, a very interesting phenomena. They looked at books, they found books, they managed to find out all the books, and much of 19th century literature books have blind pages before and after, even we do. But what was fascinating, what got their interest was that these pages were not empty, they were used for a purpose by Victorian women readers. And what was the purpose? The purpose was that they would jot down their laundry list or their monthly home budget, household budget, at the end of these pages. Now, my, you know, what they say is that reading those things along with the book itself, uh, they said that they found how, for the Victorian housewives, the book itself had such a utilitarian, utilitarian, utilitarian value, much at home much beyond its literary merit, much beyond its literary merit, right? Something that told that 
something that told big book historians if Victorian housewives were being, you know, uh, penny wise were found for this. <laughs> so, uh, so that's uh, what uh, when you said about our kind of friends, books as hypertext. So again, George Lando, uh, this guy is uh, uh, a digital book historian, book theorist. He's written a book titled Hypertext, The Convergence of Contemporary Critical Critical Theory and Technology. And technology. So we all know now what a hypertext is. We've been able to make presentations now by how you hyperlink linking, embedding, links itself. So a hypertext is like a text with embedded links. And the reader, the reader himself, sort of it, it sort of liberates the reader because then uh, the, the narrative of the book itself invites a more vigorous, a more dynamic participation of the reader. So, you know, Rola Bach would have been very extremely excited had he been in today's age to think that, you know, when he said the death of the author is the birth of the reader. So, in that sense, um, so a lot of contemporary writers, contemporary authors are using the very interface of an e-book in order to create immersive experiences combining cinema, audio, video, uh, even game-like reading experience. So there is another book uh, uh, called Pride, P-R-Y which came out in 2014 by a, a, a writer named Samantha, Samantha Gorman. And what she does is again very interesting. It invites the reader, Gorman's book called The Pride, P-R-Y, it invites the reader, again, to touch the narrative, to touch the narrative, which means uh, the book has several chapters. Each chapter immerses the reader or invites the reader into a different cognitive space, an immersive, a different immersive cognitive space. Just to give you some a simple example, what it does is the the, the character in this book, right, is a Gulf War veteran, and he is suffering from PTSD. So what the book does. It invites you to touch the screen. When you touch the screen, what do you see first of all on the screen? You see the character, the characters in it. And when you pinch the screen, you know what we do on smartphones, when you pinch the screen, when you are prying into his psyche. So you become, the reader becomes a kind of a voyeur, a voyeur for whom the book interface becomes like opening, opening a Venetian bank. And so you pry into, you pry into the unconsciousness or the psyche in order to understand the trauma. There are many people who are doing trauma studies to understand the trauma of this Gulf War veteran. What a wonderful way to use interface and incorporate it as part of the narrative itself and mesh it into the narrative. You know, once again, the technology may seem new, of course it may seem new and disruptive, very innovative, but think about Virginia Woolf's waves. The connection is obvious, I mean, except, that, except for the touch screen, right? We were talking about stream of consciousness, no? <laughs> right? So if books then, friends, are changing, now readers and readers reading changing too. Are our students changing? Uh, I think students are of course changing. Uh, uh, we talk, we talked about, you talked about not the digital divide, you talked about digital uni uni unity, isn't it? And so, more and more, of course, with my research students, I do find them abandoning what we use, what we still call close reading or deep reading, you know, in favor of hyper reading. And there is a death. You know, hyper reading is, uh, again, to use a, I'm quoting a line from Catherine Hayes. She describes hyper reading as the reading that aims to conserve attention by quickly identifying relevant information so that only relatively few portions of a given text are actually there. So we are actually talk talking about reading that is becoming skin and scan. Not deep, not immersive in that sense. 
So with you know with each passing year, the profile I find the profile of my literature students also changing because my own literature students go to uh, Shakespeare and to the classics in digital formats and video games. So for them, uh, for them it's not uh, for them it's not Shakespeare in the Wordsworth classics or the Arden edition. For them Shakespeare is Vishal Bhattacharya. For them, Shakespeare is uh, John Madden. Huh? John Madden, Shakespeare is Vishal Bhardwaj, Shakespeare is John Madden. Or, um, uh, so, I mean, I, you know, our students, the very profile of our students are changing to such an extent that they search Professor Wikipedia and Dr. Google instead of asking searching questions in the class. <laughs> so they prefer, uh, you know, Names like A.C. Bradley, you and I, we knew our Shakespeare, we learned our Shakespeare from A.C. Bradley, uh, Thomas De Quincey, and Stephen Greenblatt, we were mentioning Stephen Greenblatt. You know, these are, for our students, these are names of people from planet Mars. <laughs> and they, you know, no fault of theirs, we are talking about a generation where the digital gap increasingly becomes widened. And each year, I have to, you know, I have to upgrade myself. Like, you know, like we upgrade our computer, na? hard disk barado, storage barado. I tell my computer that, so he looks at me quizzically saying, it's time you change your hardware as well. <laughs> right? so, so my students are students who, you know, who are probably more, they know more about the Game of Thrones about, rather than the throne of Denmark. <laughs> they are the ones who say, winter is coming, rather than this is the winter of this country. <laughs> Anyway, so I keep it short in the sense I do tell my students that you, know, you are digitally, digital natives and digitally handicapped. So, ah, one more point. Uh, see, he kept referring to me. Uh, Pranti will say this, Pranti will say that. And, you know, uh, I suddenly felt like Harry Blue with his anxiety of him. Yeah, sir, I mean, for having sharing a dinner with you, this is not that. Anyway, I answered this also. <laughs> when, what is the first question that you ask when somebody says that uh, uh, when you are introduced to a writer? When you are introduced to a writer, what is the first question that you ask him? Have you published? <laughs> have, have you published? So Somali man, you know, who didn't believe me when I said I published, I published this, I published that. <laughs> so she asked me to, she asked me to get a cargo of my books to physic as physical evidence, which is there outside this office. <laughs> right. So have you, have you published anything? So you know that, friends, on a more serious note, the act of publication is the act of putting up something in public and that is central to our cultural definition of book authors and publisher and so when you talk about social media tools today we are talking about blogs which are all the things that we mentioned um, we are sort of fantastically reinventing the writer's public act itself the public act because writing has now become a book is a performative art the aesthetics now is, a, is that of performance. When you are interfacing with the book, getting a cloud burst on, a, on the screen, well, you're getting, you're getting a performance here. In January this year, something very sad uh, I, uh, you know, happened. Uh, that was to learn that Hanif Qureshi, one of my favorite writers, Hanif Qureshi uh, met with a fall and uh, uh, you know, he sort of broke his fracture, his spine, leading to complete, you know, complete paralysis of his arms and legs. Now, for an author like Hanif Qureshi, prolific author, prolific author, one of the best voices, what does he do when he wants to write? Think about it. Think about a, a disabled writer in the time of digital technology, digital age, where there you are. So it is digital technology that enables enables a disabled writer to still write and publish, but not in the form in which we are accustomed to. So what he has done is he has taken to what is that called? 
uh, Substack. Substack is a online newsletter, and what he's doing is in a, he's putting it, he's putting his next novel in a series of tweets on Substack. So if you want to follow, if you want to read it, and how does he manage? He how does he do that? Well, he does it with the, with the help of a scribe. It's his wife and his son who have been here. They are called now. They are called the Qureshi Chronicles. What a wonderful way. The Qureshi chron Chronicles. They call the Qureshi chron Chronicles. So when you are talking about digital technology and its destructive influence, you can see how technology can appear in such a way. So. Uh, um, of course, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so will bots replace us? I mean, will bots replace books? What was that? I I bought Chat GPT. Did I get it right? I bought AI. I bought how to say it? I bought GPT. I bought GPT. Right. So this artificial intelligence bot, right? Will they be the future book, book, book writers and the future Booker Prize winners? Uh, already some universities have banned it. The references to who is saying? No, no, no. What uh, uh, Chandrasekhar. Yeah, he brought it up, isn't it? So uh, to that I would say that you know John McCarthy, friends, John McCarthy, the inventor of this AI bot, can never become called Matt McCarthy. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, I'm wrapping it up. It's four. So, friends, um, we're looking at uh, something that we're looking at the very concept, the very notion of book, authorship, reading as a cultural practice that is changing so drastically uh, through the disruptive part of technology. And what I feel is that despite despite the elegies written to print, despite the encomiums to the death predicting the book, the death of the book, uh, the book will always be there, maybe in a different form, maybe in a multimedia form, in an interactive form, but the book will always be there. But the point that I was wanting, I, I sort of wrap it up by suggesting that you know, the books have really come a long way from uh, the movable type of Gutenberg that I was referring to, to Gutenberg's online book archive project. And uh, so I, I feel that rather than thinking of books in terms of a, bi a sort of a, a false dichotomy, this binary that we create between print and digital, I think we should appreciate its continuities rather than its discontinuities. I think we should uh, uh, appreciate its continuities. And so, my parting shot for you that books matter. Books matter maybe in any form, in any format, both print as well as digital. So, books will never go out of print, and writers will never rest in peace. Long live good and work. <laughs> Thank you so much. They literally done the last time.